Okay, right. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our Strategic Cereal Farm Results Webinar on Understanding and Improving Nutrient Use Efficiency. My name is Anna Reynolds, um, and I'll be your host for today. Today we'll be covering trials across strategic farms, North, South and Scotland. And we're actually in Scotland here today with David Aglin and Joel Williams, who you'll let, I'll do some special effects later and you'll be able to see them. Um, we'll be examining effects of drainage, biological soil amendments and foliar nitrogen today. Um, pretty much everyone involved in the trials is here, so there's plenty of opportunity to ask questions. But for to start with, um, some general housekeeping points. If we can have this housekeeping slide, please, Maya. Um, so just want to confirm that everybody's uh, on mute except for the speakers and we can't see you so don't worry. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, if you're having technical issues, there's a box on the right hand side of the screen where you can type messages to us. Um, only the speakers and us will be able to see them so they're private. If you didn't enter your basis on Neuroso details when you registered or if you're not sure, then please write your name, membership number and postcode into the question box and we can register your attendance to get the points. Um, as with the questions, only staff and speakers are able to see those bits of information. The webinar is being recorded, uh, recorded and is, will be available to watch later. And we're scheduled to be here until four o'clock. So without further ado, we're going to start by looking at foliar nitrogen. Um, so, and the first, the first speaker up is going to be Joel Williams, who happens to be here with us in Scotland. As we just did a final um, soil secrets meeting um, here. So, what we'll do is, is we'll start with Joel to give a little bit of um, background information about nutrient use efficiency, nitrogen use efficiency, uh, and then hand over to Fiona Burnett, who'll be talking about the strategic farm trials in Scotland uh, with David Agnan. So, if um, if we could. Um, my uh, next slide, next slide. Next slide. Next slide. Let's get to the, uh, the Joel slide, please, Maya. Okay, well, we'll go with the background of that slide. That's not too bad. So, Joel, my special effect here. There you are. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> and um, I think there was a next slide that was maybe you could advance through. Yeah, we're going to talk just briefly about um, nutrient use efficiencies. And this is a topic that we've been talking about. There we go. Um, this was a topic that we've been talking about a little bit in the Soil Secrets lecture series and um, particularly bringing in two different definitions. Now, there's many different ways to, to, monitor, to, to measure, to monitor, to manage nitrogen use efficiencies. And I was kind of keen in the lecture series to talk a little bit about one of the alternative definitions. But to start with the um, classic uh, definition of nutrient use efficiency, of course, is the one that we're all familiar with, one that I'm sure many of you would be aware of. It's this idea of trying to minimize the losses. So it's about how, based on how much nitrogen did we apply, and then how much of that actually got into the, into the crop, uh, into the pastures, you know, depending on what the context might be. So it's, it's really saying the goal is here about maximizing uptake, maximizing entry into the plant and minimizing the amount of those losses. And that's that classic definition of, <clears throat> of nitrogen use efficiency. And really to be a little more specific, what that's referring to could be clarified and it's in it's the wording there to, to describe it more so as nitrogen uptake efficiency how well are we taking up the nitrogen that we apply and the other uh, definition of nitrogen use efficiencies that we were talking about in the lecture series in the past um, few weeks here has been the nitrogen utilization efficiency and this is a little bit different this is really talking about once we get nitrogen into the plant how much biomass can we produce or how much yield can we produce per unit of nitrogen that is then taken up and that then opens up the discussion about a few different dimensions to nitrogen management and it really opens a discussion of using different forms of nitrogen for example nitrate versus ammonium versus urea versus other organic forms like amino acids and looking at what is the energetic cost for the plant to make use of those different forms? And so this then opens up this different discussion about efficiencies. Some of those are more or less efficient at growing biomass, <clears throat> for example, than others. And the simple <clears throat> kind of um, summary of this is really that the 
inorganic forms like nitrate and ammonium, although they're the dominant forms that we typically use, they're cost-effective forms of nitrogen, um, but they do involve a lot of energy for the plant to turn those into proteins, into other organic molecules, into amino acids, and other things that the plant requires. And so they therefore create a slightly greater energetic demand as compared to those organic forms. And so plants can indeed take up things like amino acids directly, and these have an efficiency gain just for the very simple reason that they are already organic forms. This is then also true of urea. Um, urea is an organic molecule. Um, I know it's not a certified organic input, uh, of course, but it is an organic molecule. It is, has carbon embedded in it. So it behaves a little bit like an amino acid. It is like an organic molecule that has a certain efficiency gain. And that's kind of part of the rationale of the discussion around foliar nitrogen and using urea as a foliar is because of that carbon embedded, because it is an organic molecule, um, it is it passes through the leaf very effectively. Um, it has a charged neutral molecule, so it passes through the leaf very efficiently, very rapidly. And this is part of the gain or the efficient potential efficiency gain of urea as a foliar, is that we get that nitrogen into the plant as urea, as an organic molecule. As soon as urea is applied to the soil, of course, some of that urea is prone to being converted back to ammonium and back to nitrates, those inorganic forms. So that's kind of just in a nutshell, this is the kind of the rationale about some of the discussion about foliar nitrogen. It's about trying to bypass the soil to avoid some of those losses, the leaching, the volatilization, the off-gassing, et cetera, and delivering the nitrogen straight into the plant. And then from there, we open up that kind of dialogue about the different forms of nitrogen, and some of which are more efficient because they um, involve less energy for the plant to, to ultimately turn into um, proteins and other functional organic molecules that the plants require. So, okay, so that um, is then the nitrogen utilization efficiency. And um, we'll pass on to Fiona now, who's going to talk about some of the trial work from David, and David's here. So, you might want to chime in or pop in some comments along the way or at the end, uh, we'll take some questions and things um, to kind of flesh out a few more details of what's been done for the last few years there and some of the things that they've, they've observed. So, Thanks, Joel. And I think Maya's driving my slides for me. So if we can hop onto that. I'm presenting today on behalf of my colleague, Steve Hode, who's managed um, these two work packages at the Strategic Farm in Scotland. Yeah, and, and Joel's given a nice introduction there, but it gives us a chance to talk about the crop nitrogen and nutrition projects that we've been doing um, with David. Can I have the next slide, Maya? So we had a number of um, different hypotheses in play when we were designing these, these trials. Um, so what we were trying to do was use crop nutrition to improve the crop health and the efficiency of inputs. Um, and we were looking at different methods of nitrogen and nutrient application, and then doing lots of intensive crop monitoring, so including tissue testing, um, both conventional and using bricks and sap tests, um, and also measuring crop health to see what the, the interplay was. And then fundamentally, we were trying to assess the economic benefit um, on yield and grain quality from different approaches. And then, again, Joel's introduced this concept, trying to indicate whether we had changes in resource use efficiency in the crop. And then the next slide, Maya, should have the beginnings of the protocols. Yeah. So we had, uh, we've had a run of nitrogen uh, trials and a run of crop nutrition trials in wheat. So if I just kind of talk through what the protocols were, and again, one of the strengths of the farm is that beginning to duplicate treatments over seasons, um, which is building, you know, a really solid um, data source. So the nitrogen trials, we had three treatments, um, standard ammonium nitrate. Um, we had ammonium nitrate followed by um, liquid urea. Um, and it was kind of five or six applications per season. And then the third treatment was um, the um, urea treatment followed by foliar applications of nitrogen. Um, so in the first year, as you can see from the protocol, they were both 160 kilos. 
Um, but in the second year, that adjusted um, liquid treatment actually had a lower nitrogen content. So that's important when we get to the kind of efficiency of uptake. Um, and the other thing to note there is that in that third treatment, we were adjusting trace elements. Um, and some of the results suggest, for example, that manganese is quite often quite variable at the farm. And we were working in tram lines um, to fit with David's operations, so 36 metre wide um, tram line trials. And then the next slide should take us on to the nutrition trials, thanks. So here we had four treatments. So we were starting with a standard ammonium nitrate um, with PGR, but without fungicides. But again, you see that asterisk. So we often have problems with yellow rust at the farm. So actually um, putting fungicides in it, at, to manage that ha has been a feature. And then we have the standard treatment with fungicides. So it's a standard Scottish agronomy input program that, that goes on to the farm. And then we have these two tailored agronomy treatments where we're trying to respond to um, what the, the, the crop is, is telling us. So the tailored agronomy treatment one is adjusting the fertilizer and crop protection. Um, so again, we tend to be working at 160 kilos of nitrogen. In that first one, that's 80 kilos to start with, um, preceded by and followed by foliar nitrogen and trace elements. Um, so that varies, so it's 128 kilos in the first year and 140 in the second year, but again, lower than those conventional treatments. And then the fourth treatment you see there is the same as that tailored agronomy, but with a biological treatment as well. So adding, as, as David calls them, bugs in a jug. And then the next slide. We've you know, again, as Joel introduced there, you can slice and dice efficiency many ways. So Steve's presented this in a number of, of different ways, but essentially the, the charts I'll talk through now are um, over the two harvest yield years, um, looking at yield, grain nitrogen, nitrogen offtake in the grain, then the yield per unit of fertilizer, bearing in mind that we had different levels of nitrogen input, nitrogen offtake in the grain per unit of fertilizer, and then looking at some of the crop health measures as well. And they're always set out the figures that I'm going to show in a kind of pattern. So on the left, you've got the nitrogen trial over 2022 and 2023, and then we've got the nutrition trial on the right. Next slide, please, Maya. So here we're looking at, at grain yield. Um, so if we start on the on the left there with the with the nitrogen trial, you can see that in 2022 it's that standard um, ammonium nitrate um, fertilizer treatment that's pulling ahead. Um, but in fact, there's a hint there that the the tailored the liquid um, UAN followed by foliar uh, urea is is slightly ahead um, of the ammonium nitrate at the start. And then if we look at the, the nutrition trial, it's that standard uh, approach with uh, fungicides that, that's pulling ahead there. And for 2023, um, you almost see for the nitrogen trial a slight reversal there, although I add a caveat, you see there's very large um, standard errors around some of those yields. And again, we can talk a bit about how the trials looked in the field and the sorts of gradients we were seeing across and, and along tram lines. Um, but there, in fact, you see that from the green yield in 2022, it's the, the foliar nitrogen that has the highest yield. And again, if we look at the tailored agronomy on the right there, there's a very small yield increase um, to that tailored approach um, to the inputs. If I can have the next slide, this is just to sort of caveat some of the difficulties at working on, on tram lines and why replication becomes useful. So here you have those yields um, by the whole tram lines on the left, as I presented, where you show in 2023 that it's the foliar approaches that are ahead in yield. But actually, if you look at the management zone, which is the top end of the tram lines, where Steve was doing a lot of the measurements, in fact, the story is somewhat different, the, the standard one pulls ahead. And we can look at some of the pictures and images of the trial to kind of unpick um, what's going on along the tram lines. Next slide, please, Maya. So here we're looking at green uh, nitrogen 
um, against those different treatments. So if we look at 2022 there, you can see from the top line that it's the foliar nitrogen treatments that have slightly lower um, nitrogen percentages. And then for the tailored agronomy, it's there's a modest increase um, to the, that tailored approach, particularly where we didn't have the biology in. And then for 2023, uh, oh, sorry, back again, Maya. Um, we can see that it's the uh, ammonium nitrate treatment um, that pulls ahead for that green nitrogen. Um, and then for the, uh, the nutrition trial on the right there, um, it's that tailored approach, again, without the biology that, that's pulling to the front there. So that's quite an interesting um, finding from, from 2023. And then the next slide, please, Maya. So here we're looking at the grain nitrogen offtake per hectare, so broadly reflected of the, of the, of the yield. So again, um, in 2022, you see that conventional ammonium nitrate approach to, to the nitrogen pulling ahead, um, a modest increase to that UAN plus foliar urea. Um, and then for the nutrition trial, it's the standard agronomy that's just pulling ahead there, the plus fungicides. And in 2023, again, we see that kind of response, very small differences in the in the nitrogen trial on the left there, but in the, the right-hand one there, it's the tailored um, nutrition approach, which is, is slightly ahead. And bearing in mind that these had lower nitrogen inputs, that's, that's quite interesting. So then the next slide, Maya. Here we're beginning to look at nitrogen use efficiency. So we've got green yield um, per fertilizer nitrogen, a kilogram per kilogram presented here. And here for 2022, you can see that on the left there is the ammonium nitrate treatment that's pulling ahead. But again, that sort of liquid start followed by foliar inputs um, is pulling slightly ahead of the of the where we started with ammonium nitrate. And then for the nutrition trial, it's those tailored approaches that begin to have the best nitrogen use efficiency. So that again, because they had lower levels of nitrogen going in, um, in by presenting it this way, you see that they are pulling ahead of the standard approaches. And then for 2023, um, it's the foliar nitrogen and tailored agronomy, which are giving the best nitrogen use efficiency. So again, in 2023 in the nitrogen trial, we only had 130 units of, of nitrogen um, going on um, compared to 160 in that conventional um, ammonium nitrate start. So that's why the efficiency looks so much better presented um, in this way. And then the next slide, please, Maya. This is nitrogen uptake efficiency. So presenting it as grain uh, nitrogen offtake per fertilizer um, nitrogen. Um, so again, we start to get kind of similar patterns coming through. In 2022, ammonium nitrate and tailored agronomy showing the best nitrogen offtake per unit of nitrogen fertilizer. And then in 2023, it's the foliar um, nitrogen and the tailored agronomy, which are showing the best nitrogen offtake per unit of, of nitrogen fertilizer that, that we put on. And then the next slide, Maya. So here we, we've monitored the, the crop health um, quite intensively, and there are no strong correlations, but there are some interesting effects when you when you look at treatments. So um, in 2022, um, you can see that it's the standard agronomy um, with or without fungicide that had the highest um, green area index. And again, bearing in mind that minus fungicides isn't truly minus fungicides, we did have to manage um, yellow rust. And then in 2023, you can see that there are no significant treatment effects. The, 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 the green area index is broadly fairly similar across treatments. Um, and again, a, a kind of another strange uh, weather season where we had you know, protracted um, dry periods during stem extension, which may well have impacted on, on disease. And then the next slide, Maya. We're actually looking at the, the leaf health. So here we're looking primarily at septoria 
and yellow rust added together just to give a kind of leaf loss um, measure. Uh, so for 2022, it's the foliar uh, nitrogen and the standard agronomy without fungicide, which has slightly more, slightly more disease going on. And then in 2023, um, a slightly different story in that it's the foliar nitrogen, um, which has less disease and less yield loss. Um, and you see those tailored approaches actually looking um, substantially better um, when it comes to you know, leaf loss to disease um, compared to those standard approaches. So again, that's quite an interesting effect uh, from 2023. And then the next slide, Maya, here, Steve has, has graphed out um, the grain yield and the nitrogen efficiency, um, just presenting it in a slightly different way. So the circles are, are 2022 and the triangles are 2023. And it just kind of shows you the different effects between years. So if we start on the left here, um, you can see that it's the ammonium nitrate treatments, um, which are more efficient um, than the, the foliar nitrogen ones. Uh, and then 2023, so those triangles, um, you're, again, you're seeing that it's the foliar nitrogens giving the best yield and the highest efficiency. And then on the right hand side there, um, we've got the, the nutrition trial results. Um, so for 2022, um, you can see that there's a kind of cluster uh, of low yielding but more efficient treatments. And then for 2023, you see that clutch of, of triangles in the in the top right um, corner there. So high yields and quite high efficiency from that tailored agronomy approach in 2023. So it was a much more effective approach uh, in 2023 than in the in the previous year. So again, these seasonal effects are why it's so interesting to be able to run similar protocols over a number of years um, at the site. And then the next slide, Maya. Yes, I'll move on to look at some of the images. So beginning to think about the use of crop and yield maps and, and looking at that variation across the site. Um, as referenced, we did see quite strong field gradients between and along tram lines. That's why doing far mark is, is interesting. Um, and we continue to make small adjustments to the nitrogen and nutrition trials based on, on learning experience. So, you know, for example, the kind of no fungicide approach is proving quite vulnerable at the site. So a kind of reduced um, level of input, but still putting some fungicides in is, is where we'd like to go. Um, and then adding grazing in, uh, David is very keen on, on the effects of, of grazing. Uh, over the winter to manage uh, canopies um, to kind of compact soil in a good way uh, and add a bit of organic matter. So we tried a bit of that this year and we'll do a bit more next year. And David can talk some more about how we will adjust um, going into next season. And then the next slide, Maya. It's just to show you some of the variation and maybe visualize um, what, what graphs uh, I've, I've just been talking through. So here we have the, the nutrient trial uh, on the left uh, in Denfield and in front of Brandon. Um, and you can see the kind of outline plan with the, the tram lines labeled off there. Um, we overlaid a grazing effect. So you can see that front of Brandon was, was grazed by sheep uh, and the den wasn't. So we had sort of an indicative try at that this year. Um, and then you can see how Steve tries to sort of compact it and do a, a measurement zone so that he's going back to the same area in the, in the crop for some of the more detailed assessments, although we're taking yield off the, the whole tram lines. And then on the right there, you see the nitrogen trial. So that was in Castle Park. Um, the clue is in the name. There's a castle in the middle of the field. Uh, and again, you can see how the, the treatments were laid out in that uh, adjusted nitrogen trial. And then the next slide, Maya. What we've got here is a, a, a drone uh, image um, from me over the Castle Park field. And I think it illustrates quite nicely some of the variation between treatments and also the kind of gradient effect that we see along and across the tram lines here. Um, so 
if we look at maybe five and six, so two different folio end treatments, um, you see them looking much paler in the measurement zone, although so the similar treatments, one and two at the other end of the trial, actually look quite green. And then we've quite a difference there between tram lines three and four, which were both ammonium nitrate. And you see a gradient running down and through the castle as well. And this is some of, you know, again, it's the power of being able to replicate and do stuff over years to be able to iron out some of these, these variants. And then the next slide is um, adding the yield map onto that information. So again, you see the, the treatments overlaid onto that um, tramline effect. Um, but there you see quite nicely um, the kind of the, the lower yields um, in some of those lighter strips. Um, and you see the kind of gradient effect across the field so that the top of the field there where we had um, tram lines one and two are yielding higher than the ones, um, you know, five and six. So again, this is something where we're learning a lot about how we analyse um, the site. And then the next slide, I think we move on to the other fields. Yes. So this is looking at the nutrition trial um, in the DEN field and in front of Brandon. Um, and again, here you see that the tram lines are much more even uh, in their effect. We're not getting a strong difference between grazing and not grazed. So if you remember, it was the front of Brandon there on the right that was grazed off. Um, but what you see is very strong uh, tram line effects here. Um, so you see the tailored agronomy in three, four, six and eight, you know, really showing as much greener uh, again at this overflight at the end of May. And then the next slide, Maya. This is overlaying the, the treatments onto that uh, yield map again. So you see um, that it's the, the higher yielding field uh, on, the, on the left there. Um, but you can see there the differences between the, the tram lines uh, and that tailored agronomy, uh, particularly on the right there, just showing us a slightly healthier and more efficient, efficient crop with those sort of higher yielding um, grey colours uh, on, this, on this yield map. And then the next slide, Maya. Yeah, just really summarising where we've got to with this. So, um, we're seeing significant seasonal and tramline variation, um, and we've shown some of those images today. But I think what the trials demonstrate is there's certainly scope to improve the, the use of foliar nitrogen. And particularly in 2023, that tailored agronomy approach showing promise both when it comes to yield and nitrogen use efficiency. Uh, and also the, the sort of suggestion that adjusting agronomic inputs really affects leaf health. Some of that's very obvious when we think in terms of with and without uh, fungicides, but there were some interesting effects there from the tailored approach. Um, and that's something that we will, you know, look further at in the in subsequent years of, of this work. Grazing, um, let's say we had a kind of plus and minus across two fields this year, just to have a look, see no significant yield effects this year or effects on, on nitrogen use efficiency. But we'll be doing that in a, in a more calculated way next year. And again, the, the power of doing that over seasons, um, we'll see what effect that, that brings. And then again, what we've learned is that crop assessments um, need to be timely and representative. So that's why we started working in kind of more concentrated assessment zones. So we can really go back to the same positions in the trial and try and reduce at least some of the variation that we see between results. And I think that's my final slide, Maya, but give me a click just in case. Yeah, that's just thanks. Um, so yes, um, David can interject if I've got anything too far adrift there. Thank you very much, Fiona. That's brilliant. Anything to add at this stage, David? Just briefly, we'll we'll deal with the questions at the end. Uh, only that it, it was really good to see the foliar nitrogen starting to actually have a, a, a greater benefit than than using. More, would be more typical standard practice. You know, mm -hmm. last year it, 
we were just struggling slightly with the practicalities of the trial and field scale and getting it all did, done in among farm work um, mm -hmm. you know, as well. But this year we really got it sorted and we're starting to see real dividends, I think, from it. Yep. I think the trials and, and the results show that. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Fiona. Thank you, David. Thank you, Joel. Um, we will, we've got some questions coming in already on this. So what we'll do is we'll take all the questions and go through them at the very end. Um, so now we'll go on to the next presentation. We've got Elizabeth Stogdale from NIAB and David Miller, host, uh, one of our strategic farm hosts. And I'll, um, yeah, I'm going to hand over to Elizabeth. Thank you very much. Oh, well, are you going to do a poll question first, Anna? Okay, yes. All right. Okay. Well, before we do that, then, yes, poll question. So, what priority do you give to improving nutrient use efficiency or nitrogen use efficiency on your farm? So, if you could get the, um, those answers up. So, give it one more minute and have we got the answers? Yeah, very important to the business. Hi. So, yeah, most answers say that it's very, very important. So, it's good that we're having these discussions now, particularly with some of these um, alternative new approaches and pushing new boundaries. Yeah, very, very clearly, very timely. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Maya. I'll, at this point, I will hand over to Elizabeth Stockdale to go with our next set of trials. Thank you. Thank you. We can just skip through the in the um, title because we're going to talk about establishment and, and, and management of, the, of that um, step. But you can just go to the next slide, Maya. So David's been doing this for a long time and thinking about establishment. I think establishment is one of those steps in crop production that's probably received less attention in terms of its management. It's just about getting seed in the ground. And it's actually the focus of, of regen farmers that has taken us back to really looking very carefully at establishment, not just in terms of machinery, but in terms of having the ground in that real fit state, whether that's using inputs alongside seeds such as um, DAP or biologicals. And this matters because that's really the foundation for the establishment cycle and uh, for the whole crop growth cycle. And, and I remember, because I'm old like this, in 1992-93 doing crop trials in a wet autumn where we'd got really different we get really different nitrogen responses in the following crop based on whether a crop had been established before the rain started or if it had been puddled in afterwards. And in that context, establishing in really good conditions and getting crops to weigh well is really important for subsequent nutrient use efficiency. But of course, there are a whole range of factors that might affect establishment where some are in the farmer's control and some not. And designing an establishment system on farm is therefore a complicated business. And David's just going to take us through the journey that he's gone through to move from an old fashioned focused beauty contest focus, perhaps David on establishment and having those very beautiful even crops through to the regen approach, which perhaps takes a less beauty and more functional approach to establishment. But, but do just take us through your story. Do you have the next slide, Maya? Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I just want to run through some of the things just to put in context where we are and what our soil types are, etc. So um, we've, we're working on all grade three land. Um, it's shallow soil over chalk, which means it's very free draining, um, relatively light loam. But we do have plenty of clay cap and also we have an abundance of flints, which uh, makes the soil very, very wear and for, for anything steel and also very hard on tyres. Um, the long term average rainfall on the farm is, is over 50 uh, since, yeah, for, for the last 50 years is around about 850 mil. Um, but the 10 year average is creeping up. So we're more like 950 to 1000. And just to put that into context this year, so far this year, we've had somewhere in the region of 1300 millimetres. So it has been a very wet year for us. Um, and we're also working at height 155, 185 metres above sea level. Uh, if we could have the next slide, please. So where we've come from, um, this would have been our, uh, our previous cultivations for, for winter crops. It was very much disc and tine. Uh, and running through with a Vardastat drill, so very traditional for 
for what was for us uh, something like uh, 10 years ago now, something like that. Um, and we're also, by doing that, we are mineralizing nitrogen right the way through. So if you have the next slide, please. The spring crops, a lot of ours, um, going back a little bit further, would have been nearly all ploughed. Um, and then in the spring, through with a set of spring tines, um, again, drilled with a Vardestat drill, rolled down. And with our soils, consolidation was actually much more of an issue than actually compaction. Um, trying to get these soils back down relatively tight was always a bit of an issue. But again, mineralizing a lot of nitrogen. Um, and the figure we keep hearing is 30 kilos of nitrogen mineralized by, by moving the soil. Um, so if we can look at the next slide, please. Um, what does 30 kilograms of nitrogen look like? Um, this is a photo I took a number of years ago when we were starting on direct drilling. The, uh, the electric company had put a whole new set of poles through the middle of this field, which we then had to rectify because they made a fair mess through there. So the middle of that field was cultivated and, and the rest of the field was left. So that's where your 30 kilos of nitrogen helps you to establish a crop. Um, somebody told me that was like burning your house down to cook a burger, that you've actually got rid of all your nitrogen. Um, so, uh, can we have the next slide, please? Um, this has gone back to 2012, and if you can look at that picture carefully, you can see a line that um, defines the left and the right of that picture. The left-hand side is um, where we had where we hadn't tried a cover crop, and the right-hand side is where we first tried a crop of crimson clover. And this was 18 months before this photo was taken. So you can see this slightly darker line through there on the right-hand side, which was one of the things that really um, started to get us interested in cover crops and, and how we could help to establish our crops. Um, we got a derogation to use um, DAP in the early stages, um, just to try and um, mitigate this loss of 30 kilos of mineralized nitrogen. Um, and we used that until from 2016 through to 2021 uh, with reducing rates. So we started off at 90 kilos a hectare and we finished up at around about 25 kilos a hectare. The reason we didn't continue using it was because we knew that it was um, through through soil tests we'd had done that this was actually um, having a big detrimental effects on the amount of mycorrhizal fungi in the soil. Everywhere we put DAP, um, we reduced the mycorrhizal association. So we knew that it wasn't a long-term thing for us to continue doing that, as the long-term aim was was to um, increase soil health, not to just produce crops um, at any cost. So we then made the step change um, in 2021 into trying to look at um, whether we should be looking at biological um, amendments. And, and this is what Liz will come on to through her um, graphs, et cetera, later on. So rather than having chemical intervention with the DAP, we were going to be looking at more biological intervention. Um, so we can just stick the last slide up. So we've gone from um, having a, a Vardastat drill. We had a, a cross lot drill for a number of years, uh, from 15 to 2020, um, and then from 2020 onwards, we've we've had the Horizon drill. Um, but again, the disc drills, we're just we're minimising our soil movement, and now we have to try and mitigate. The, the effects of that minimal soil movement. So we'll hear how we've got on so far. Over to you. Thank you. Next slide, please, Maya. I think it's also important to recognise that these changes around establishment, as, as David hinted at, have also accompanied other changes in, in the cropping system, in particular the integration of cover crops. The particular trial here was looking at the impact of those biological soil amendments 
potentially as a replacement for DAP, potentially doing completely different things in terms of supporting rapid crop um, establishment or at least appropriate crop establishment. So it might be about supporting biological associations, not just about getting a greener crop faster. So the key here was the range of assessments that were carried out, looking at crop rooting systems as well as the above ground. Um, and looking at microbial activity in the rhizosphere and AMFs and bioses at the onset of stem extension when those are um, at their greatest in a, in a crop cycle. And we looked at this in 21 um, and then for the sorry for crops harvested in 22 and 23. So winter wheat in 22 so the products went on establishment in autumn 21 and then a spring crop spring wheat in 23 so went on in spring 23 at establishment for winter wheat next slide please Maya so the work was done um, in tram lines um, on uh, one field um, looking at two contrasting soil amendments so one a vermicompost humate extract um, and won a molasses plus amendment. So in, it included molasses as a um, stimulator of soil activity, but also a range of micronutrients and some organisms and cells added to the soil. And then the combination of those two. So to make my um, thingy shorter, I've gone with the VCH as a, as a shorthand for vermicompost humate, but that's those two treatments added together. And we began in a, in a first wheat after oilseed rape, um, moved on there, as I've already said, into the um, spring wheat. So next slide, please. Just to show you the soils, I think one of the things that's really noticeable about David's soil is how nice it is. It might be quite stony and it's quite difficult to dig and I'm aware it'll be very wearing on metal, but inherently that means because of the high calcium, the chalky loam soil, they're very nicely structured. So we can see here, these are spade tests with the soil opening up very nicely to give us very good um, uh, VES scores, the straw structure scores here of, of one to um, showing that crumbly structure very good earthworm numbers in arable systems there per spade block the target is nine using the um, AHDB soil health scorecard indicators and those there's no difference between those replicates there they're just around that that target number with pH sitting at eight which I think is important here to bear in mind um, in terms of further crop nutrition but good indices for PKs, um, good for MG on those high calcium soils, but um, we might see a response to a small amount of um, magnesium addition and very good soil organic matter levels there, particularly because that high calcium carbonate in the soil really does stabilise organic materials in a, in a way that's, that's unique to the way that calcium interacts in the soil. So very good organic matter, very good structure. And so the base for us looking at these treatments is, well, very good soils and perhaps we, we we certainly didn't expect to see big changes in structure from the moment things were applied but those are those um, visual assessments done in early spring um, following the application of the treatments with no significant differences in any of the um, measured structural or chemical biological properties between the soils next slide please so we can also might ask well if the focus was on replacing that mineral nitrogen that might have been available, we're looking here at kilograms per hectare measured in the autumn. Actually, the soils at David's here are producing somewhere around 50, um, 40 to 60 kilos on average, and no difference here between the treatments. There's some slightly different patterns between treatments, but no consistent difference um, in the patterns caused or link, that can be causally linked to the path, to the treatment application rather than any other variation in the field. But just useful to note that soil mineral in the autumn in these reasonably good level organic matter soils with good biological activity is, is not a key limiting factor. Next, please. The soils were sent to Soil Biolab um, the data here are, are the data that were returned there along with the guidelines and I, and I note that those guidelines um, changed between the years and haven't had a chance to follow up with um, Soil Biolab to discuss why. But we see there again 
differences, but not significant differences between the treatments. So there are differences between the tram lines, but there is no significant pattern of differences between the treatments, whether in terms of total bacteria. And I think we see quite a big variation from time to time of sampling so that the actual moisture and temperature at time of sampling can have quite big impacts on the observed microbe amounts, so the size of the population and also its activity. Um, a note here of, about the ratio between the two um, returned by Soil Biolab tends to indicate the kinds of population that's there. Fungi come in two types of two main ecotypes, of course, those that are root associated. So those are likely to be larger where the crop or cover crop is growing well. And also saprophytic fungi that break down organic matter in soil that aren't root associated. And so we, we potentially might need to delve a little bit deeper to really see the differences uh, between the plots here. But I think the key thing to really note here is that there's no significant enhancement of this soil biology emerging from the use of, of either the um, vermi compost humates or the molasses and, and other enhancement treatments. Next slide please. So in simple summary in terms of soil health we've got very good soils which give us very good root growth and consequently these products that are there to support and develop soil biology are having relatively little impact because the soil biology is already good and that feeds through to no differences in emergence or plant crowns or ground cover scores. Um, the, the management system across the field as a whole, the integration of cover crops, the, the drilling approach and perhaps just the weather we had for establishment and perhaps David's patience in getting his establishment timing right were more important than these additional treatments. Next slide, please. So we go through and look at the, uh, the as we go to estimating impact on yields, Fiona's already shown us yield maps. NIAB cleans up yield maps in a slightly different way to um, SRUC. So what you see here are these blocks associated with particular areas, but the same idea that we've coloured here, darker colours indicate higher yields. Um, a spread and a variation between tram lines, but no consistent pattern again. So these are these are rep don't forget there's replication in here of treatments. So we've got the what you go, oh, there's a very low long run of yellows there associated with the um, boost treatment, but actually the other boost treatment is a good run of um, darker greens and so on. And so there's no clear structure in terms of the, the yield differences between the treatments here emerging into um, crop yield. This is for the spring wheat data. Um, and we've got those individual replicate yields. And I think, you know, given the soil, grade three soil, shallow soils over chalk, uh, spring wheat yields in the high fives and early sixes as tons per hectare are good yields on, in, these, in this site. Next slide, please. So in the context of the winter wheat, the average yield across the site was 10 tons per hectare. And again, no difference between the yields, the similar there as to what I've showed you in detail for spring wheat. So also, just to note, no observable differences in the mycorrhizal colonisation of those roots, followed through to crop disease or any of the um, um, quality parameters, protein or specific weights. So no clear change in soil health and no clear change in yield suggests perhaps that in this particular set of circumstances, these aren't giving us a benefit. That isn't to say that perhaps they might not have done if they'd been implemented as David used DAP at the beginning of his transition process. But where we're here in the in the fully embedded now into the regenerative management system of the farm, we're seeing no impact of these particular treatments on the soils or on the crops. Next slide, please. So the question was really what next? And David might want to pop up to talk about this one. This is POTOs taken in the in the um, field last, I'm gonna say last week, I think it was last week. This is um, the next year's winter wheat, um, which was grown with a bu buckwheat companion, David. And I've circled some buckwheat. That picture there is me finding some buckwheat. You assured me it had been frosted out. I found a little bit still growing in the treatment, um, but you might want to comment on on your thoughts on, on where you might go and, and the assessments that we're gonna make around this companion's work as we go forward. Yeah, it's it's been a very interesting uh, exercise to put all these different bits together, and I think what we have found uh, 
um, elsewhere with what the HDB have been doing and also um, South East Water and FWAG have been doing a lot of trials with cover crops and one of the things that we've we've, we've been trying to influence obviously is the, the level of bacteria to fungi um, through the uh, through trying to put the amendments on we've been trying to pull that balance back more in favour of, of the fungi um, but what we've found with the cover crop trials is um, certainly this year we've got some of those cover crops where they've had the same uh, biological soil test done we've been able to reverse that in the space of about four months with a with a multi-species cover crop within the in the rotation so it really got us thinking that actually us trying to spend money on on products to to try and do this maybe we're better off to spend our money on uh, seed to be able to put various uh, companion crops in with um, in with the wheat just to see if that will actually do the same job as we've been able to do within the cover crops and it's very much a watch this space i don't think we, we we're we're not very excited about our treatments for this year coming but we're going to follow them i think our target is to establish some really interesting companions next summer and into the autumn to, to really see what we might do and, and perhaps even think about stitching wheat into an established catch crop for example as, as a as a treatment but thank you very much everyone okay. thank you elizabeth thank you david Brilliant. Well, can't wait to see the next steps on that trial. Um, I think that's um, really, really interesting. Next up, we're going to talk about drainage. Uh, we've got Kate Smith from ADAS and David Blacker, if you'd like to reappear. And um, yeah, um, before we hand over to you, I'm not going to caught out, get caught out this time. I think if we go to the next slide, I believe there's another poll. Uh, make sure everybody's definitely awake. So if you could, um, yeah, if you could answer this question what if anything prevents you from working to improve nutrient use efficiency on your farm okay you want the answer is time needed to analyze farm data very interesting yes definitely having scientists on hand to, to help with analysis is is a massive benefit that we have got when running trials so that's yeah i think that's that's a big one um brilliant thank you very much everybody if you have questions of the speakers please don't forget to pop them into the question box and we'll come back to those to the end but in the meantime i will hand over to kate smith and david blacker thank you Great, thank you, Anna. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Yeah, we have been carrying out a um, drainage trial with uh, uh, David at Strategic Farm North, and um, this year we have the first baseline in year results to present. And I really, uh, on Dave's farm, um, he has some very heavy clay soils, and um, some one of the main issues is with having periods of water logging or the soils just being too wet to work. And um, when da David um, um, started to install some new drains in 2022, this um, gave us the opportunity to set up a trial on one of the the most problematic farms on 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 the field uh, on the farm. And um, yeah, I don't know, Dave, if you want to just give a bit of background about. Um, the soils and drainage of the farm. Yeah, okay. So we're so the farm's uh, predominantly clay loam over clay, um, and you you get down to sort of 25, 30 centimeters, and it it's just some a big block of uh, horrible yellow clay that goes down for uh, as long as you want to dig with a spade. Um, the drainage in it already, some of it's under drained already, but not since the war period. So the, and there's very little backfill on any of it. Um, what I'm finding is um, the, the periods and the, the level of water that, that comes in big downpours nowadays are for such a prolonged period of time, um, it just can't get down to the drains fast enough. So uh, I'm suffering an awful lot with uh, water logging on the top, um, poor porosity through the clay, it, um, well, and water that just you know, hangs around too long on the top, 
it, and it's creating uh, obviously creating yield um, detriments. Um, fail crops, the, the field that we've actually drained, I think I've had three fail crops in there that have failed to come through winter, established okay, but failed to come through winter uh, just because they've been, been far too waterlogged. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, we started to redrain the farm. Uh, I ended up buying my own uh, tractor mounted trencher. Um, given the, the quantity of land I had to redo, I thought that was going to be the cheapest option of doing it. Um, uh, and I know a lot of the drainage work uh, research that's been done was done by Dick God Godwin, who, and it's you know years old. Um, and I think Dick's recommendation was 20 meter centers on a drain, uh, which for me, uh, I think is still a bit too wide. So uh, we've set this trial up where we've, I've done some at 10 meter centers, some at 15 and some at 20 meter centers. Um, to try and get an economical um, um, bit of research behind you know, what is the most economical width to do it in. Certainly for me on, the, on my size, I think 20 is too wide. Um, 15 might be about right, but if you go down to 10, is it is it worth the extra investment or is 15 enough? So uh, yeah, we, so this is yeah, one of the trial and we're gonna follow this through for a few years. Um, uh, further down the line, start looking a bit more at the soil. Um, are quite clearly anaerobic for most of the year, so um, yeah, we're going to look going forward at uh, can we can we see can we see the soil improving now it's actually more aerobic. That's great, thanks, Dave. Great. Okay, so um, just to just to give some more general uh, background information, so you know, as Dave has been explaining, that you know these are heavy clay soils and they're very slowly parable. So um you know without that it's essential that they are drained and without drainage they can be waterlogged for long periods and particularly in areas of high rainfall um just to give a bit of technical background and thinking about how the water moves through these heavy soils so the diagram to the left if we look at that we can see that on these clay soils, we can have preferential flow or, or bypass flow occurring through these long fissures um, um, going down the soil pro profile. And, and these are, are features of well-structured clay soils and they act as, as the motorway to the soil. So the water will um, ideally bypass much of the soil matrix and, and make its way down to the drain. In contrast, when we, we get much slower water movement um, through matrix flow, we've got clay soil, smaller pore space, that's very slow, very gradual. And when the soils are saturated, we can get subsurface or interflow. So that's basically water moving sideways below the soil surface. And that can happen really during the very he heavy rainfall that Dave was talking about. And equally, um, we'll, we can get surface runoff and that will occur again when soils are saturated or when, during heavy rainfall or if there's some sort of compaction lowering that, slowing down that infiltration of water. So really of importance in these heavy clay soils is that um, having that good porosity in the topsoil, but also having those uh, macro pores, those cracks um, linking down the top and the subsoil are really important for getting water away. And then in terms of drainage, um, you know, re this can occur either as, you know, modern perforated plastic pipes or if installed, um, say after the war, they would be as old clay pipes and they would be um, accompanied by some gravel backfill and, um, and, and they can also be accompanied in these clay soils with, with some mold draining, which can help to link, this, link those um, physical drains. And molding is basically having a, a bullet with a expander passing through that clay subsoil, and it runs through the permanent backfill just to provide that link there. Um, and really, if we think of the benefits of dra improving drainage, that the whole wide range, range of benefits, and the list here isn't an exhaustive list, but if we just focus on the key ones in terms of benefits for nutrient use efficiency, they include um, more rapid warming of soils in the spring, so that gives us more, improves the number of work days and, and improved germination of the crops better balance of water and oxygen for, for roots, 
um, better crop uptake of soil mineral nitrogen, improved crop yield and quality, an improved environment for soil organisms, less structural damage to soils as we're not working them when they're wet or less likely to, reduced surface runoff, erosion and you know, the associated nutrients with that, that water loss. So if we go on to the next slide. Okay, so moving on to the, the trial design. So the trial is taking place at um, Overton 5 and um, this was redrained, redrained in May and September of 2022. And um, as, as Dave pointed out, there, there are lateral drains at three different spacing. spacing. So we've got in the blue, you can see we've got the 10 metre spacing, in the orange, the 15 metre spacing, and in the green, we've got 20 metre spacing. And then we've the 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 we have um, four different sort of soil texture drainage zones. So new drains have been established on lighter clay loam soil. So that's indicated by the the letter number code one C. So in that bottom corner, and new drains have also been installed on the slightly heavier textured clay soil, which is labelled by two C. We've been able to retain an area that's not drained, so that's indicated by 2A. And we also have an area that we've retained of the old, old drainage system 2B. And the photos you can see at the bottom there just show the drainage, drainage installation taking place. And you can see the gravel backfill there on, as well on the bottom. Next slide, please. So in um, just to highlight, yep, the overall objective, as we've mentioned, is just to assess the impact of the drainage um, on crop performance. And in harvest year 2023, the crop was in, um, the field was in winter beans. And we ca we've carried out a whole range of assessments on both soils and crops. And these were carried out in each of the soil drainage zones. So I'll just quickly run through these. So start off with, um, over the, the winter period, we, or Dave should say, collected drainage water samples um, by um, going down into the inspection hatches and um, collecting samples on three occasions. Um, these were sent off for analysis of nitrate, ammonium and, and total phosphorus. And um, the, we struggled to attribute the, 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 the samples to the different um, uh, drainage area. So uh, we won't present the, the results from those today, um, but overall we couldn't really see any differences between the samples and, and where we, we believe they were coming from. Crop biomass assessments um, were carried out as well, a whole range, um, including growth stage, plant counts, NDVI, tiller, plant tissue analysis, a um, whole range of soil samples in both the topsoil and upper subsoil. This included chemical analysis, penetrometer resistance, vis visual assessment of soil structure in both the topsoil and as a sub -vas. assessing um, the, uh, the water characteristics of the soil, so measuring plant available water holding capacity. We also assessed uh, crop disease during the season and um, we saw no difference um, to, between the different treatments So um, from, from at, at this year. And finally, at harvest, we, we collected samples on um, pre-harvest biomass samples and um, analysed Dave's yield map using um, uh, the agronomic software. And finally, um, post harvest, we uh, have collected rooting samples as well, which um, would be really interesting to see if we can pick up differences between the drainage treatments and the soil structure differences. Um, but, and these will become available um, later in the year with the final report. Um, and just to the right, just so you're aware, we, these are the soil depths we were measuring at. So when we talk about topsoil, we've been measuring from 0 to 15 centimetres. VES, it's 0 to 30 centimetres, so that's its convention. Upper subsoil, 15 to 30 centimetres. And then sub VES is assessments carried out at 30 to 65 centimetres. OK, next slide, please. OK, so just on to the results then. And um, as part of the topsoil uh, analysis, um, we have um, 
um, characterise these according to the AHDB um, BBRO so health so school card so that we can start to tease out whether we can see any differences between the, the drainage and um, the soil texture zones. And really what we're seeing is that um, soil organic matter is above average for this soil type and region. Um, and it was markedly higher on the heavier texture soils. And this was associated with higher nutrient status and a higher pH. So those ambers for the old drains, the new drains there are not because the magnesium is low, it's because it's high. So we've got an index six there of magnesium. Um, in terms of soil structure, um, we're picking out some differences there. We found that poor top soil structure was observed where on the um, when new drains were installed on the heavier textured soil so that's that bottom row there where in comparison um, soil structure was firm in all of our um, soil zones. Overall um, we're finding that earthworm numbers are low in number um, except in the old drainage zone um, which had around six worms per pit and in terms of the population, there was a little bit of unbalance as well going on. We found that all earthworms were juvenile, so we weren't able to identify um, worms down to ecotype there. And so next slide, please. And just to show you an example of um, the, the VES schools really and how we can, you know, we're seeing what sort of difference we've seen here. So these two samples um, uh, are both clay textured soils. And on the left is um, a, a sample taken from zone 2B, so that's the old drains. And on the right is a sample taken from uh, zone 2C, the new drains. And really the only real major significant difference between these soils and the is that the fact that one's had drains installed and not, and the other hasn't. And so, um, on the old range, you can see that this is an this has a smaller, uh, a crummier texture of uh, uh, near the top of the surface. It's got smaller aggregates and it's got a, a greater amount of porosity. So it's basically been left undisturbed. Whilst where the drains have been installed on on, on the heavy clay soil, we're seeing more massive structures there and um, and less of that porosity. On, and, and that has translated out into that higher sort of limiting layer score of 3.5 for the new drains and, and a lower score of three for the old drains there. So basically just showing that the, the drains and installation when the soils were a bit wet um, caused a, a small amount of compaction there. Next slide, please. And nicely, we had the opportunity to uh, carry out some sub assessments, which is, uh, I must say, is not something that we often get to do. So we, it was great to be able to dig some pits, down, pits and to look at the soil structure down to, to 60 centimetres depth here. And we're, we're basically seeing that we've got poor subsoil structure. I mean, as Dave was saying, they are massive structures, they're, they're grey as well, indicating a, a, a level of anaerobic conditions. And um, so we've seen scores of four to four and a half, and um, typically sub scores were a little bit improved, so lower scores at the upper horizons, um, or where soil texture was lighter in, in the field, really, so on the, on the, on the lighter textured soil. If you could just click for me as well, please. Yeah, perfect. So that that so as an example of a good soil structure, this is this is a um, a different parent material. So this is on a, a Denchworth shrink swell clay soil, and um, it's able to dry out much more easily than on Dave soils. But what you can see is you can see those vertical fissures, those motorways, that, which will really help to get the water away. Whereas what Dave's got is he's he's on a, um, a stagnant soil. It's it's a soil that's characterised by these semi-permanent um, waterlogged periods, and so it doesn't have so much opportunity to have that drying out to get that restructuring. And that's why it's so important to have drainage on these soils. 
Next slide, please. Um, as part of the trial, we, we um, to help characterise this, the soil and understand the different types of soil water contents, we've collected samples from each of the um, drainage soil texture zones from both the topsoil and the lower, lower topsoil. And we've placed the soils on a sand table and pressure plate to measure soil water availability. So what we've, we've done is we've measured water at field capacity. So we sh that is water that's held in the soil after excess um, water has drained away. We also measured moisture at permanent wilting points. So that's at the point where plants are unable to extract the water from the soil. And then the difference between, between these two measures gives us the, the value of available water capacity. So that's the amount of water content that's available to the plant. And that's measured or reported on a volume basis. And we know that typically soils um, hold a lot more water at field capacity, but um, a lot of this is held in small pools as well. So we, we know that not all of this is going to be available for plant uptake. And if we look at some of the, the values that we're getting for the topsoil results, where we can compare this to typical values for agricultural, agricultural land classification that we measured in 1988, we can see that in zone one on the clay loam soil, we've got a available water capacity of 21%, which compared to a typical value of clay loam is higher, at, which for the agricult uh, agricultural land classification is 18%. And then on the heavier clay soils, we have available water capacities between 19 and 20, 22%, again, higher than what is typically reported by the agricultural land classification. And just to put that in context with some other soil types, you know, we're seeing we'll have much higher available water capacities for silt loam soils at 23%, whereas a sandy soil, a medium sandy soil with much larger pores will have a um, available water capacity of around 12%. Next slide, please. Now moving on to harvest and um, the winter bean yield maps that we've got. Um, we measured an overall average yield across the field of 4.1 tonnes per hectare, which is um, within the average for the year for, for winter beans. Um, and if we compare yields within the different soil zones, we're seeing a um, significant benefit of uh, new drains over um, uh, the older drains, so a yield increase of 0.67 tonnes per hectare. Um, when we compare new drains over no drains, we're getting a 0.77 tonnes per hectare yield increase. And when we compare the yield in the no drains, drainage area and the old drains, there's no difference. Um, within the um, clay loam uh, soil type, so that's area 1C, there's so much, there's a, the greatest amount of variation. And you, and if we can click, please, that'd be great. Great. And so the, this, this is just probably a bit more clearer to see with the NDVI map that was um, satellite map that from April 2023. So very early on in the season, the, we can see that NDVI is much lower for where the, the no or old drains are positioned compared to the where the new drains are located in the, the clay soil. And at the bottom there, where the, the clay loam soil is located, we're getting that huge variability there in, in soil and in, in, in yield, sorry. And if we if you could click once more, please. So based on um, these initial differences in yield from this first year and based on what, what Dave's expecting for uh, winter wheat, we can start to make some very rough calculations uh, at how long it will take to pay back for, for this drainage um, system. So overall, um, we Dave's estimated that the, the price of the dra drainage is around two and a half thousand per hectare. And if we um, take a couple of scenarios, one where we 
um, assume, so we've got a, sorry, we've got a um, rotation where we're including winter beans followed by winter wheat, a year of stewardship, then back into winter wheat and then another year of stewardship. So in the years when we have winter beans, we're going to assume a 0.67 tonnes per hectare yield increase, which is what we measured this year. In the first scenario, we're assuming that winter wheat yield uh, will increase on the drainage compared to no uh, old drains by three tonnes per hectare, uh, bringing yield up to 10 tonnes per hectare. And in, in this scenario, uh, we'll get payback in nine years. In scenario two, we're keeping winter bean yield the same at 0.67 tonnes per hectare, but this time we're saying that the um, winter wheat yield um, was a bit more conservative, a two and a half ton per hectare increase. And if that was the case, we'd, we'd pay back in 12 years. Um, I mean, this is a very sort of a rough estimate for how long it might take to pay back. It, um, and it, it's in line with the estimates in the AHDB drainage guide, but it doesn't really take about account of all factors. So, you know, basically, there's thing, other things we can save, a reduced cost of herbicides, um, just the, the, the co factors that we can't quantify, such as the, the improved accessibility to get on land, you know, the increase in work days, and the impact that will have on the length in the growing season. And also, as Dave highlighted um, in this field, you know, more recently, he's lost um, had crop failure in three years due to crop not surviving over winter. So as we go on and the trial progresses, we can um, refine these figures. Okay, on to my final slide. And I don't, uh, Dave, I don't know if you've got some things that you'd like to add um, at this point as well. Uh, if you want to pop up, um, please do. <laughs> so basically in this uh, final sort of in this baseline in you, you know, we're seeing very early on the benefits of the installing the new drains over um, and we've seen that improvement in crop yields um, it, on the winter bean yields. Soil structure was poor in the subsoil and moderate to poor in the topsoil, so we'll be uh, seeing how that changes over time. In um, harvest year 2024, the priority will be to continue to monitor crop performance and then soil health will be assessed in later years, probably in harvest year 2025. And that's it from me. Dave, do you have anything you'd like to add? Uh, uh, not, not really. I just um, stress that you know, this year has been a very wet season and um, certainly having, having fields that, that are drained and are drier has really made the difference between getting them planted or not getting them planted this season uh, and that's been you know very noticeable locally that you know if you've got badly drained soils a lot of them either didn't establish or didn't get planted didn't even get attempted um so yeah it's um the the most focus in my mind is getting my drainage sorted out across the farm yeah. Um, but you know it's expensive. You can't do it all at once. There's, a, there's an awful lot to do. Uh, but you've got to start somewhere. So. That's great. Thanks, Dave. And that's all from us. Thank you. That's brilliant. Thank you very much. Hey, thank you very much, Dave. What we're going to do next is if we can have everybody on the panel turn their cameras on, and I shall do my little trick here of revealing <laughs> the panelists next to me. Others. There we go. I'm going to have to lean in a little bit. Um, and we're going to go through some of the questions that we've been asked, which is brilliant. So we've had plenty of questions. So um, I was going to start with um, Kate and David. We've had a few for you. Um, and one is that it sounds like um, David's got some challenging soils for drainage to improve nitrogen use efficiency. Would you expect quick results on medium and light soil types? Uh I, don't, I wouldn't know where to start answering that. Yeah. <laughs> I, probably, I probably would, given that you know, I'd, you'd expect to get a, a bigger root system to make the most of the nitrogen that you're applying on, on those kind of soils. Uh, yeah, I won't get a root system that you would expect on a sand of a loam. Yeah, I think I think on Dave's soil type as well. I mean, drainage to to work these soils for for arable use is just essential, really. Um, and um, you, 
I mean, you can see that from the structure of the subsoil, just how wet they are and how they hold on to soil moisture. So they are really challenging soils. Um, and it's a big cost investment, um, as, as Dave was saying. So um, it'll be really interesting to see um, how, how things progress over time, really. Yeah, thank you. And a question just came in about the, um, the beans. Did the waterlogging affect the beans this year? And if so, when? Yeah, I mean, it obviously affected the canopy size and it affected the yield. Um, but there was still a crop there. They were established in a good enough condition that, you yeah, know, we still got a crop off, off all the fields, which I've got, I've got more yield, yield maps with bits missing than I haven't from that field. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, it was nice to actually get a full crop for once. Um, uh, but yeah, the, the performance of the beans, certainly where it was not drained or the old drain systems was, yeah, noticeably, uh, noticeably worse to look at and to, you know, to see the data after. Thank you. And a question here for Liz and David. Um, have you sacrificed margin to focus on looking after the soil? The big one. Um, the simple answer is no. Um, we may have sacrificed a little bit of yield, but we certainly haven't sacrificed margins. Thank you very much, David. Um, Okay, we've got one for Fiona who has, has to go, but we've got Joel and David here. Um, so kind of casting our minds back to the first presentation. Um, so somebody commented, it's quite a lengthy one, so I'm just going to read this out. Um, so I understand that urea is usually hydro hydrolyzed on a surface of the leaf before absorption and taking up as ammonium. Um, and some research shows that the sprays have inefficiency due to this as ammonia um, is, is emitted to the air uh, and maybe the urea um, can have some odd effects in the plant so really in other words what are we doing to help the plant make use of the foliar urea okay um well <clears throat> having listened to joel speak a number of times over the years excuse me it's become apparent that just putting urea on plant alone is possibly not as effective so <clears throat> if we go back to the basics of what other building blocks within the system the crop needs to to um, metabolize the urea you know it needs plenty of manganese plenty of magnesium and further up it needs phosphate and sulfur and lots of others that Joel could list better than I we've tried to put the urea on in a balanced form so we've, we've adjusted the pH um, to a certain extent with some um, fulvic acid so that's put a bit more carbon in there and then we've added in these other trace elements into the mix to, to get a more rounded um, package for the urea so it's basically we're giving it the, the plant every chance of taking that urea in as effectively as we can so that we're not just putting it on and wasting it as it were yeah I, th I think I would just add that it is also important in this discussion to acidify the spray mix, so applying acidified urea, because at lower spray pH, this will then suppress the activity of that urease enzyme. Now, yes, there is some urease enzyme on the leaf, and yes, there can be some volatilized off, but this, of course, is a fraction compared to the amount of the sheer amount of urease we would find um, down in the soil. So this is the argument to try and put it through the foliage. And if you can acidify that spray mix, that will suppress that urease enzyme so that you get it, um, therefore, into the plant. And urea being a charged neutral molecule means that it passes through the leaf very rapidly. And there's lots of work has been shown at the, looking at the speed of that urea absorption. And because of that charge neutrality of that molecule, yes, it happens very, very quickly. And that's part of its advantage. The quicker you get it in, the less time it's sitting around externally to be volatilized off. So um, that's really the, I guess, some of the little more details under the spray mix and the design of the spray solution that can then help to offset some of those problems. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Um, next question we've got for Liz and David. Um, is it worth doing soil microbiological assessments? It's a question really. And if they're so variable between, can you, you know, between them when you collect them, uh, should we just be doing something else for um, soil biology? Yeah. 
the answer is always it depends. So everybody here who's ever talked to me knows that I only answer questions by saying it depends, which is it depends what you want to know. So if you do really want to know about the population of microbes, particularly bacteria and fungi in the soil, the best way to do that is currently to have them counted. Um, it's a very expensive way. You could have them done in an alternative expensive way, which is using DNA based techniques, but those are not currently available. They would give us more resolution in terms of the kind of population, but they're not really available to farming unless you've got some spare hundreds of pounds per analysis. I would argue that, and I do regularly, that actually if you don't start with a spade and look at the structure of the soil and how that soil's behaving, you're missing a lot because that tells you quite a lot about the soil biology and the way the soil's active without needing to do expensive additional assessments. And of course, I'm going to say, Anna, that the AHDB soil health scorecard gives us a really nice baseline. I worked in a team that helped develop that alongside Andrew Gala ADAS and um, Christine Watson at SIUC. Um, it gives us the baseline to work from, but it doesn't mean that those added measurements, whether they're CO2 burst to look at activity or the kind of count measurements we looked here, can't add value if those are the things you really want to find out about. And so we haven't got a perfect set of those biological measurements available to us at all, but it doesn't mean they're, they're pointless. We just have to use them in a tailored way. And I think here they showed us that the amendments we were using weren't making big differences. And I think that was an important finding. Not finding differences is actually just as important as finding big differences sometimes. Yeah, that's very true. Thank you very much for that. Um, and the next question, we're going back to Kate and Dave and looking, thinking at that drainage trial. Um, what can be done, do you think, on farm to improve the earthworm count and uh, will that help the drainage? That's a very good uh, and very pertinent question because we're going to be looking at that as one of the trials going forward next year. You know, the, the big red flag on all of my vessels from, from the baseline in year was I've got no earthworms. Uh, and the ones I have got were all juveniles. So for whatever reason, they're, they're, you know, there's no adults. They're not, they're not surviving. Um, and I don't know, I don't quite know why that is. So uh, yeah, we're setting up a trial next year to, to look at that in a bit more detail. Yeah, yeah. When um, I think when Anne and, and the team were up in, in um, an open day um, this year, that they, they went and had a look in the fields and to just have a quick look-see as well, just to confirm what was going on with the, with the results we were getting and dig, dug some soil up in the headland and again in, in, in the main part of the field. They could see a lot more earthworms in the headland and we just wondered if there was a bit more, I think you had a mix growing there as well. Is that right, Dave? Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was an environmental mix that had been in clover for two years. Uh, yeah. And that was absolutely tipping with worms. Mm. Uh, whereas you go into the field um, where, you know, it's had soil uh, chopped straw put back on it every year for about nine years. Um, so it's not like there's you know not no organic amendments going back, but whether chop straw is not a great diet for worms or not, I don't know. Um, yeah. We've always kind of been led to believe that you know if you don't mess up where they live and you give them something to eat, that your populations will go up just on their own; they'll, they'll just appear. Uh, that's not been the case for me, certainly. Yeah. Uh, so is it you know what one might see in a drainage trial? Is it is it lack of oxygen that's killing them off? Yeah. But, you know, so in anaerobic conditions. So. <clears throat> Uh, so we're setting up a trial next year that's going to have, um, if we eventually get it established, um, uh, four tram lines of a clover understory. Um, and then uh, going the opposite way across the field, we're going to put some um, compost amendment on. So we'll end up with like a checkerboard trial. So some will have nothing, some will have just clover, some will have compost and clover. Um, so that'll be quite interesting. But we, we currently, we haven't got the clover established as slugs of eating it all. And, um, it's too wet to spread the compost, so that's work in progress for next year. Yes, just watch this space. <laughs> watch this space, brilliant. Thank you for that. And um, another question for you was, um, it'd be very interesting to know how much nitrogen might be made available as a result of improved drainage too, in terms of a kind of the monetary value. Can this be calculated? Yeah, I mean, this is, this is something that we're trying to um, Get a grip on this year as well. So last year we 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 did um, we measured 
tried to measure the amount of nitrogen being lost in the drainage water, but we couldn't attribute it um, effectively to the different drainage areas. So we've not that on the head. And, and this year, we're, we're going to look at soil nitrogen supply balance, see if that can give some sort of indication of whether we can pick up some differences between the different drainage systems. And we'll be measuring that. We've measured that in the autumn and we'll repeat it at the end of drainage. And yeah, if we pick up some differences, we can certainly put a monetary value on that, really. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll look at the, the, uh, or the previous webinar we did on data. Um, you know, that I, I asked uh, I asked Ada specifically to look to see if there was a, a correlation between yields and organic matter levels. And they, they certainly couldn't see it off all my data. Um, but what it did flag up was uh, the suggestion that my organic matters are, are high because the nutrients aren't cycling, because the, soil, you know, the, the biology of the soil is not working for six months of the year. It's all switched off because it's anaerobic. Um, so I've got an accumulation of organic matter building up in the soil. Um, that, that if I get my soil right, my fields drained, uh, and a, you know, a bit more biology going on, that could actually cycling, and um, I could you see my organic matter levels drop. But what was quite interesting was that that leads to the argument that well, okay, if you've got high organic matter soils, that can actually be an indicator of a poor soil, not just a good soil. Uh, so I'm, yeah. quite, I'm quite glad actually that I haven't sold my carbon credits because if I get these fields working, they potentially might drop. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it, it's really just how nice, like not looking at things in isolation. So the 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 um yeah, not just looking at the relation between the organic matter and the yield, but if the drainage isn't right in the first place, then that explains why. Um, yeah, you you won't you're not we're not seeing the relationship or potentially not seeing the relationship we would expect really. Yeah, that's really interesting and highlights the importance of that systems approach, isn't it? That where everything is going to have an effect and it's it's going to be multiplied and. Um, it might not be what you expect by just looking at a couple of a, a couple of variables only. Um, yeah. That's yeah, really fascinating. And uh, we are running over slightly, so we're just going to take one more question here. Um, and I think it's pertinent to discussion we were having earlier about some of the sort of um, fungal activity in in your field, David. Urea has a reputation of acting as a fungicide, apparently. Says, says the questioner. Um, was there any side of this in these trials? Um. Anecdotally, I would say yes, but I, I, it never twigged in my head that there was a urea was having a fungicide effect. What I put it down to was that on the foliar treatment, we were giving the crop 10 kilos a hectare of nitrogen every 10 to 14 days. And so we weren't putting the plant out of balance. So this kept the plant healthier, so it was less susceptible to disease. That was. That's the argument I was choosing. Um, whereas the ones that the, the plots that we put two dollops of 80 kilos of nitrogen on, clearly, the, clearly the disease was eating into those towards the end of the season. And I think Fiona had a slide um, in her in her presentation earlier that showed um, a reduction. There was more green leaf retention later on in the season. Um, with the foliar nitrogen than there was with the standard inputs. So it might well have been fungicidal, but in my head it was about nutrition um, being balanced. And so the crop just wasn't suffering from disease as a result. I don't know. What do you think, Joel? Yeah, and I think the subtlety in here is that because David was not applying straight urea on its own, he had additional additives like the carbon sources, the fulvic acid. So you're going to have this buffering effect where the, those carbon um, compounds will be like a sponge and be binding up. So I think you're going to be reducing some of that um, highly soluble kind of nutrient burden, which might be part of the mechanism of urea as a fungicide. So I, my, my guess is that because you've added these carbon additives to buffer that, that harshness that it may have had less of a fungicide effect compared to applying straight neat urea on its own. So um, yeah, so yeah, it's maybe a certainly part of the effect. It's a great question, but um, whether or not those extra additives might have buffered that out is hard to say, but yeah, good question. Yeah, very good. It sounds like there's a couple of potential mechanisms there, but which one it is exactly, we, we, we can't tell um, at present, but yeah, lots of options. 
Fantastic. Well, that's that will be it for the questions. Thank you so much for everybody, to everybody for tuning in and for everybody for the presentations and the research and, and for work done on your farms. It's been yeah, brilliant and we look forward to the next year of trials. Thank you very much, everyone. And have a lovely rest of the day.